With the previous chapter, we have seen how we can use quantum mechanics to build up complex systems from smaller parts. In this chapter, we are making these parts really fundamental, namely we consider the case that they constitute indistinguishable particles. The first key point will be to assume that we cannot attach any specific labels to these particles. This leads us to impose some further constraints on the quantum description, namely symmetry constraints on the wave function. And with these, we are guided towards the distinction of elementary particles into two categories, bosons and fermions. For fermions, the consequences of these symmetry constraints are most obvious as they lead to Pauli's exclusion principle. This powerful principle applies, for instance, to electrons, as we will illustrate on several levels. What it means for the combined states of such particles when we inspect their orbital and spin degrees of freedom, how this manifests itself, for instance, when we let these particles populate the states in a box, and how this features as an organizing mechanism in the periodic table of chemical elements. All these examples illustrate both the fundamental nature of the Pauli principle as well as its far-reaching structural consequences, which give us a qualitative insight into a very broad range of phenomena. For bosons, the consequences of the symmetry constraints are most manifest when we deal with a large number of them, and this is an interesting situation for fermions too. The second key point of this chapter is therefore to assume that the number of particles is so large that the system acquires thermodynamic properties. In this situation, the detailed microscopic features of the states do not matter that much. Instead, we are interested in a statistical description. This again differs for fermions and bosons, leading to Fermi-Dirac and Bose-Einstein statistics. We illustrate the Fermi-Dirac statistics for the example of electronic properties of solids. Bose-Einstein statistics plays a role in many exciting quantum effects, such as Bose-Einstein condensation, superfluidity and superconductivity. And we will have a brief look at the simple mechanism for this. The example that I select here for a detailed investigation is black body radiation. The phenomenon that, as I mentioned in the introduction to this course, marked the birth of quantum mechanics when Max Planck came up with its first consistent theoretical description. And with that, we will then have reached the end of this course. We will have covered a lot of important physical phenomena and prepared the basis to much more. And this last chapter plays an important role in both regards. Okay, so let us go straight to the essence of this chapter. We deal with particles and we are interested in their positions as well as the values of any discrete intrinsic degrees of freedom, such as their spin. Here I will subsume all these intrinsic degrees of freedom into a single index sigma. Therefore, as established in the previous chapter, the wave function will be a function of all these properties and the corresponding probability density is its absolute value squared. And we will focus on systems of such particles where they are all of the same type, which is to say that we do not have any means to distinguish them. So these will essentially be elementary particles of the same species, such as electrons, even though there are ways to extend this, for instance, to composite particles such as atoms. We make this premise concrete by saying that the probability density should not change when we interchange the labels of the particles, so the indices that we attach to their positions and intrinsic degrees of freedom. I indicate this here for indices 1 and 2, but this should really hold for any pair of indices. For the wave function, this then means that interchanging the labels can at most have the effect of multiplying it by a constant. I call it alpha, as this is the only liberty we have without changing any of the observable properties. And now when we apply the same logic again to the same pair of indices, we see that alpha needs to square to 1. Note that this is not the absolute value square, just the normal square. So this leaves us exactly with two options, namely that alpha equals to plus one or minus one. Both options are indeed realized in nature, 
on the most microscopic level. And so we end up with two different types of elementary particles. One type is called bosons and for them alpha equals plus one. This means that the wave function is completely symmetric when we interchange the labels of any two identical bosons. The second type are called fermions, which are then the particles for which alpha equals minus one. And this then means that the wave function is completely antisymmetric when we interchange the labels of any two identical fermions. I emphasize here that the bosons or fermions really need to be identical for this constraint to apply, as we have several types of bosons and fermions. For instance, in the standard model of elementary particles, bosons appear as mediators of fundamental interactions. This comprises the photon, which is involved in electromagnetic interactions, the W and Z bosons, which are involved in weak interactions, and the gluons that mediate strong interactions. These are the so-called vector bosons, as they have a spin of size s equal to 1. The development of a quantized version of gravity suggests that this would involve a so-called tensor boson with spin 2, and we call this the graviton. Finally, there is also the recently confirmed Higgs boson, which has a vanishing spin and plays a role in giving masses to other particles. These other particles are in particular the elementary fermionic particles in the standard model, which are the electron, muon and tau particle, the corresponding neutrinos, and finally the quarks, of which it contains six types. All of these elementary fermions have a spin of one half. So all the bosons have an integer spin and all fermions have a half integer spin. This is indeed a strict correspondence which is borne out by the spin statistics theorem. The proof requires relativistic quantum field theory but it is not needed to explore the consequences. And we will indeed return to the word statistics in the second part of this chapter when we explore the role of these features in systems with many such particles. We can extend these considerations also to systems that contain particles of different species. The symmetry constraints then only apply to particles of the same type, and so for instance not to the proton and the electron that we considered in the hydrogen atom. As a matter of fact, the proton is itself a composite particle made out of three quarks. But when one interchanges the labels of the quarks in two protons, so three labels overall, one again picks up an overall minus sign. So these protons effectively behave as indistinguishable fermions. Similarly, a neutron is also a combination of three quarks, but a different one. And so different neutrons are again indistinguishable, but they can of course be distinguished from a proton, say by their neutral electric charge. So, more generally, a composite particle made out of an odd number of fermions would still behave like a fermion. And indeed, it still then has a half integer spin over all, such as one half for a proton or a neutron. But when we combine an even number of fermions, we effectively obtain a boson with an integer spin. An example for this would be a meson, which is a particle composed out of two quarks. We can further extend this to more complicated objects, such as atoms, with helium-3 being an example for a fermion and helium-4 being an example for a boson. These both contain two electrons, but either three or four nucleons, so protons or neutrons, and any such system can be classified analogously. And we will return to atoms very soon, but from a slightly different perspective.